Hello, my name is Laura Walter, and I'll be your guide this evening to Prairies 101, a basic introduction to the most widespread native ecosystem of this beautiful land, Tallgrass Prairie. I'm going to be on the road today, so I'm recording this in advance, but I hope to be there in person to answer your questions this evening. If you're already a prairie lover, maybe you'll pick up some new tidbits tonight or just enjoy the pictures. The photos are nearly all my own work, though some were provided by TPC colleagues. If otherwise, I cite my sources. Jeff asked me to speak to you on this topic because I work at the Tallgrass Prairie Center at the University of Northern Iowa. Our mission is to empower people to value and restore resilient, diverse Tallgrass Prairie. In this talk, I'll focus more on the value part of our mission, since you'll have other sources and speakers in this series for information on prairie restoration. But I hope that learning more about prairies will inspire you to advocate for their protection and restoration. We'll start with the basics and then explore some different kinds of prairies. We'll look at some of the species that are flowering now, both common species and ones that you may have to look harder for. And finally, I'll share some ideas for how you can help prairies across this beautiful land. I may actually be kind of a strange choice as a guide to Iowa's prairies. It, it's hard for me to even come up with an objective definition of what a prairie is, since in the places where I grew up in Kansas, it was only a short bike ride or a walk away to places where I was just surrounded by prairie. It's like asking a fish to describe the ocean. Well, a talking fish anyway. Um, this picture shows one of my favorite places on earth, the Kansas Prairie Biological Station at Kansas State University. This is where my formal study of prairies started. What is it that stands out about this image to you? Is it the desolation that my uncle from Chicago felt when he visited my research site uh, during a family reunion? Is it the openness of the sight lines and the relative lack of trees, the lack of mountains or even really steep hills? These questions are all at the landscape scale and they focus on what a prairie lacks. So what really is a prairie? A prairie landscape like the one I grew up in is a grassland but that term seems too simple. As an ecosystem, a prairie is the sum of the relationships among numerous species that interact with each other and with their physical environment. And it's more than that too. But think back to your early education. What's the base of the food web? Plants. Prairie plants are diverse. They're warm season grasses, cool season grasses, grass-like plants called sedges, legumes, other kinds of wildflowers, ferns, tiny mosses, and a few shrubs and trees. Even in small remnants of never plowed prairie of several acres, there can be well over a hundred species of plants. Each of these species varies in ways that are visible to us and that can help us to identify them. Things like leaf shape and arrangement, their height, um, degree of hairiness, the size, the shape, the number, uh, the arrangement and color of their flowers, and even the timing of their flowering. They also vary in ways that are less obvious to us in their relationships with soil organisms, um, their tendency to compete with other plants, and the invertebrate and vertebrate animals that depend on them. Because of all this diversity, studying prairies can easily be a lifelong pursuit. This map shows an estimate of the original extent of the tall grass prairie ecosystem. You can see that the entire state of Iowa is nestled in the tall grass region. So why was this area mostly prairie? Climate's part of the picture. Our average annual temperature is around 10 degrees Celsius and we have about 90 centimeters average annual precipitation, at least in part of the state where I live. If you look at this classic graph showing how biomes are related to climate, you can see that our region falls in the climate zone for woodland shrubland or temperate deciduous forest. Yet 85 to 90% of Iowa's land was historically prairie. So climate averages clearly aren't the whole story. Temperature extremes and periodic droughts do limit the ability of some species to survive here. While prairie species can tough it out usually. Even more important though, were periodic disturbances that prevented trees and shrubs from out competing the native grassland plants. Most prairie plants are well adapted to periodic fire having their growing points below the soil surface. Fires remove the thatch, 
and allow the sun to warm the soil and stimulate the regrowth of prairie plants in spring. Prairie sh shrubs, like lead plant, are also capable of re-sprouting after fire, and a few tree species, such as bur oaks, can withstand grass fires too. Fires help prevent other woody species, such as red cedars, from encroaching. It's hard to tell exactly how often fires occurred prior to European colonization, since prairies don't have as extensive a tree ring record as forests. But a conservative estimate would be at least every 10 years or so in any location. Fires started by lightning would have been most likely during the summer months, but Native Americans ignited fires during the spring and fall as well. The very timing of fires probably helped to maintain the biodiversity of the prairies. Native grazers, bison and elk, removed above ground growth of favored plants. This altered the competitive relationship among plants and increased the patchiness of the vegetation. Grazing also interacted with fire. Patches that were heavily grazed in one season were less likely to burn in subsequent seasons. People have always been important stewards of this beautiful land. This map was drawn in 1718 by French cartographer Guillaume de Lille, based on accounts received from French explorers and includes reported locations of indigenous habitations and the names of tribes, including the Iowa. The Meskwaki, Iowa, Sioux, Sauk and Fox, Omaha, Ho-Chunk, and ancestral peoples going back thousands of years lived on and with this land, using traditional ecological practices that benefited prairies, like intentionally lighting fires to stimulate grass regrowth and attract native grazers. We should respect and take inspiration from their relationship to this land. Prairies provided many benefits to people and to wildlife, both large and small. Deep-rooted perennial prairie plants built the rich soil and held it in place. The roots and soil acted like a sponge, allowing water to infiltrate and then gradually releasing it. Prairie streams and rivers ran clear due to the filtering action of prairie roots. Later, prairies provided forage for livestock and soils that were highly suitable for growing crops. Rich prairie soils rapidly yielded to the plow starting in the mid 1800s, becoming some of the world's most highly productive agricultural land. This conversion enabled the modern development of our state, but came with hidden or not so hidden costs due to the loss of the services that prairies provided. The loss and degradation of prairies continued through the 19th and 20th century with the exclusion of fire, the introduction of invasive pasture grasses, expansion of tile drainage, the mechaniz mechanization of agriculture, and increasingly intensive use of inputs like fertilizers and herbicides. Thanks to people like Ada Hayden, though, we learned to recognize and appreciate the, and protect the remaining fragments of prairie into the future. But prairies aren't out of the woods yet, if you'll forgive the pun, in the 21st century either. We're still learning how to manage these remnants and they face ongoing threats, and not everyone in the public recognizes their irreplaceable value. On the positive side, since the mid-1900s, researchers and naturalists and conservation practitioners have been working on ways to restore degraded remnants and even reconstruct prairies from seed. So here's some, some terms. Um, I'm often asked to define these terms uh, they have some areas of overlap, and they aren't always used consistently, including by me, but they can help you categorize, prior, categorize prairies according to their origin. Remnant prairies are those rare places that were never tilled. These are prairies that form through natural processes of migration and adaptation by plants, animals, animals and microbes over centuries. They preserve around a tenth of a percent of the original extent of the tall grass prairie in our state. Restoration is a process of improving a degraded prairie through management such as burning and brush control. And then reconstruction is really starting from scratch by seeding a mix of native species into bare soil, which is often former cropland. I'm actually involved in a project that is doing this called urban prairie. I also often refer to these as planted prairies. There are sticklers but in many conversations, the term restoration is applied to both restored and reconstructed prairies. And this makes sense to me since the one is restoring what's already there to an improved condition and the other is restoring a lost ecosystem to the landscape. 
So where can you find these, these rare untilled remnants? Oh, one of my favorite things is to visit a remnant prairie, whether I'm looking for seed sources for my work or just taking photographs of plants and insects or needing some time in a wild space. So where are these remnant prairies? Some are in rights of ways that were set aside for construction, safety, and maintenance along railroads and roads. Depending on the use and management of these areas, they sometimes preserve remnant prairies or at least relic populations of prairie plants, such as the state flower, the wild rose. Many are in out of the way or unique places, such as fields that were poorly suited for row crops by virtue of being too wet, too sandy, or steep and rocky, like Blackman Prairie in Butler County, which is shown in this picture. Remnant prairies may have been in a part of a farm that was difficult to till, but useful for other purposes, such as grazing or haying, like this wet prairie in Butler County that used to be a dairy pasture. Sadly, pastures and hay meadows have declined since we started putting animals in confinements and feeding them mostly grain. So I'm very grateful to the landowners who've recognized the value of these places and partnered with organizations or agencies to set the land aside for conservation. And I'm excited to learn of farmers who use regenerative grazing practices to make their farms havens for songbirds and other wildlife. Some of the most precious remnants are in pioneer cemeteries, where the space was set aside to honor the deceased. These were often true black soil prairies that are probably more representative of the prairies that once dominated our landscape. What better way is there to respect the past than to preserve the wildflowers that were there when these generations buried their loved ones in the prairie. So what's different about a remnant prairie? One aspect is their sheer diversity. Ironically, a remnant may not look as showy as a planted prairie at first, but closer study reveals many more plant species than are typically present in a planted prairie, up to several hundred species in a large remnant. Another characteristic of remnant prairies is patchiness. Plant populations have sorted themselves out across the site based on things like soil moisture, slope aspect, and competitive relationships. You can tell that the site has a long history, even if you can't specifically tell the story of why certain plants are found only in certain patches. Squat down and look through the taller stems to find the prairie understory. In a remnant, I generally find more layers and especially more smaller statue, statured, often early flowering plants like violet wood sorrel. Remnant prairies are usually much richer than planted prairies in species that flower in early spring, like wild strawberry and Ozark milk vetch, and late fall, like slender false foxglove. This floral diversity across the seasons is important for supporting many species of pollinators and other insects that are key parts of the prairie food web. Some plant species are rarely found in planted prairies at all. Some of these remnant species don't adapt well to mass seed production or are expensive to produce, and they may not establish consistently under typical planting or management practices. I was recently at a cemetery prairie that I love to visit when a neighbor approached me to complain about the weeds around the graves. Um, I know it doesn't sound like an auspicious start, but we ended up having a nice conversation and I explained that my interest in the cemetery was in the different layers of history it holds, both the, the human history and the natural history. He said that if I wanted to see pretty flowers, I could visit his pollinator CRP planting. And he challenged me to show him a wildflower at the cemetery that he didn't have in his reconstruction. I asked him if he was a betting man, but he said, only if it's a sure thing. It didn't take long to lead him to a hoary pacoon, a species that is hard to propagate from seed or transplant and is therefore rarely found in reconstructions. If we repeated this challenge at any time of the growing season, I think he would still be wise to avoid betting against the remnant prairie. So how can you find a remnant prairie near you? One way is to go to the Find a Prairie page on the Iowa Prairie Network website. 
This page includes a list of Iowa prairies by the agency or organization that owns or manages the land, as well as another list by county. You may also want to join the Prairie Network to learn about their meetings and their field trips to remnant prairies. It's great to go to these places with uh, a knowledgeable guide. The naturalists and conservationists at your county conservation board are also great sources of information about the remnant and reconstructed prairies in your area, and they often enjoy hearing from members of the public who support their work in protecting and managing these prairies. One of the reasons why I'm so passionate about remnant prairies is because they are the foundation of my work. At the Tallgrass Prairie Center, most of my job revolves around producing stock seed of Iowa source native species for native seed growers. This process starts with small samples of seed collected from multiple remnant prairies. In each prairie, we sample from as many parent plants as possible, taking only a portion of the seed from each plant. We germinate seeds in our greenhouse and grow plants that we transplant into production plant plots, where we take care of them it, until it's time to harvest their seed. We clean and store the seed we produce and make stock seed available to native seed growers. If native seed growers produce the seed at marketable quantities, public agencies and private individuals can then purchase Iowa source seed for reconstructing prairies. A yellow tag on the bag means that the seed went through record keeping and inspections to certify it as Iowa source identified. The Iowa Department of Transportation and Iowa Roadside Management Program at the TPC both specify a preference for certified Iowa source seed with that yellow tag in their annual seed beds. Remnant prairies are the genetic source of the seed we produce at the TPC. We're trying to conserve their genetic diversity and adaptation so they can be returned to our landscape. We also believe that careful management of remnant prairies is essential if we want them to survive into the future. So what can we do to help these remnant prairies? One of the biggest threats to remnants comes from encroaching shrubs, trees, or invasive plant species that shade out or outcompete remnant plants. Bringing back natural disturbances or sometimes ways to mimic the effects of those disturbances can help fight back against encroachment. Prescribed fire is probably the best management tool for prairies. Though the restoration community is continually refining the best practices for this, the timing, the frequency, and the extent of fires. The ability to use fire is complicated too by the availability of trained personnel and suitable equipment. Uh, finding weather windows can be hard, especially like in this very windy spring that we had, and also the uh, inevitable liability concerns. And in cases of severe encroachment, fires may not be enough. Grazing can increase plant diversity in prairies, but it's probably not suitable for small remnants. And when grazing is used for management, it must be done with conservation in mind. Mowing and haying may substitute partially for fire or grazing by reducing the dominance of tall grasses. Mowing leaves the cut material in place though, building up the thatch layer. So haying by removing the cut biomass may better mimic the effects of a fire. Manual brush removal is an activity that you could get involved in. Organizations like the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation have multiple volunteer events throughout the year. Join them and get on the newsletter list to stay informed of these opportunities. Please realize that small amounts of herbicide are often placed on cut shrub stumps. This is important for keeping them from re-sprouting. And don't be too alarmed if you see combinations of these management techniques being applied to remnant prairies. Even I have sometimes been shocked to see aggressive management such as mechanical brush removal in a favorite prairie remnant, but come back and observe the results in a couple of weeks say after a fire or a few months after brush removal. In the place where our county conservation board had recently um, mowed almost an entire prairie, uh, I now am seeing uh, rebounding growth of native prairie wildflowers like hoary pacoon and culver's root. So find out who manages the prairie and let them know what you observe. Ask them questions, but also thank them for what they're doing. Many of our remnant prairies need more attention and the agencies or organizations managing them vary in the resources they have for these tasks. Sadly, they probably get more complaints than support. To return the benefits of prairie to our state, we need to do more than protect and manage remnants. We need to plant more prairies. 
One of the native seed producers once put it this way, we are inoculating the landscape with what belongs here. At the Tallgrass Prairie Center, our research and restoration program works on developing science-based technical information for effective prairie reconstruction. And the Prairie on Farms and Iowa Roadside Management programs advocate for prairie planting on private lands and county roadsides and organize communities of practice to support landowners and managers in doing this effectively. And the Tallgrass Prairie Center itself is reconstructing prairie on 77 acres of former crop ground in Benton County. That's um, what we're looking at here uh, in the picture, the Irvin Prairie. Over the past five years, we've seeded the site with about 100 species of native plants, and we've added a few more species through transplanting. And still we wonder, how does this carefully reconstructed prairie compare to the prairies that existed here before? How long would it take for this prairie to look and function like a remnant prairie, both ab above and below ground? I don't really have an answer <laughs> for that, those questions. Um, but the grassland birds, like this dick thistle that are returning, seem to think that it's going well so far. So what can you expect to see in a planted prairie? Well, first off, probably a bit more uniformity. Pa plantings are generally less distinctly patchy since the same seed mix is usually applied across a large area. However, the individual plants that started from seedlings often look more bunchy than plants in a remnant prairie that have had a lot longer time to kind of spread out and mix. The planting may look more lush than a remnant prairie, but if you squat down, you may find less of an understory beneath the tall stem, so kind of less vertical structure to that habitat. Diverse wildflower rich plantings can be very showy, especially in the middle of the summer season. Seed mixes usually include at least some species with reliable establishment and consistent and obvious flowering, such as bee balm, ox eye false sunflower, and gray headed coneflower. And you can see at least the gray headed coneflower, and I think there's some uh, bee balm in this picture as well. Some plantings are more grass dominated than remnant prairies. Earlier reconstructions often started with less diverse seed mixes that were mostly or entirely grass-based, but even diverse mixes can revert to grass dominance over time, depending on the specific seed mix, the site conditions, and how they're managed. So where can you find reconstructed prairies to visit? Well, city, county, and state parks and wildlife areas often include prairies that are established and managed with goals of long-term conservation of biodiversity and increasing public access to nature. Neil Smith National Wildlife Refuge east of Des Moines includes 4,000 acres of planted prairies, making it the largest single prairie reconstruction project in the state. There are tens of thousands of acres of conservation reserve program plantings on private land around the state. You can admire them from the road, but always get permission from the landowner before entering. There are also plantings of native vegetation along state and federal highways and smaller patches along county roads across the state. If you add up all the road sites in the state, they make up 60% of our public land. So they are an important and highly visible place for adding na native vegetation back to our landscape. This kind of brings up a question. How big or diverse does a planting have to be to be a prairie? Could a roadside planting be considered a prairie? It's another question I don't have a solid answer for. This photo, though, shows some of the flowers that will be blooming at the TPC roadside planting, which really does resemble a prairie pretty nicely. Uh, they'll be flowering in a couple of weeks there. But we're going to go ahead right now and look at some pictures of some of the plants that you can see blooming in your area right now. If you're seeing blue flowers in the ditches, they're probably spiderworts. For the rest of the year, they're hard to find since their foliage blends in well with grasses, but right now they are startlingly beautiful, especially in the morning. Small bees and hoverflies often visit spiderwort flowers. And as you see on the left, there's a little jumping spider waiting for that hoverfly. So sometimes the pollinators encounter spiders in the spider warts. Here's Golden Alexanders. This is a member of the carrot family, which is found in both remnant and planted prairies, including along roadsides, where it is sometimes very abundant. Its flat-topped yellow flower clusters are somewhat similar to those of the invasive wild parsnip, but they're more delicate 
in the golden alexanders, and usually the plants are a bit shorter. Also, golden alexanders generally blooms a bit earlier in the summer than parsnip, although their blooming times do overlap, making it confusing. The lower leaves of golden alexanders shown on the right here are also usually divided into lobes or leaflets in groups of three, giving them kind of a triangular appearance, whereas wild parsnip leaflets are mostly paired. So to me, they have sort of a ladder-like appearance. So um, look closely, um, get well-versed on this. Neither plant is going to jump out and bite you, but at least you can avoid getting parsnip sap on your, on your hands or arms by um, learning how to identify the plant carefully. And one of the reasons why I think this identification is particularly important is that we don't want to spray out areas of the native golden alexanders um, and cause unintentional damage because we're trying to attack the invasive parsnip. We need to know our plants and do a careful job in managing those areas. So here's yarrow or Achillea milfolium. This is a traditional medicinal plant with sage scented foliage. You need to pick a leaf and rub it and, and, and sniff it. And it has a really um, unique smell uh, and uh, that can help you to be confident in your identification. You can find this plant flowering now in both remnant and planted prairies. It's sometimes very abundant in certain uh, planted prairies uh, where it is used to supplement that early flowering season. Sometimes this plant is mistaken for Queen Anne's lace or wild carrot, but the flower structure is quite different if you look at it closely. And also the leaves are different. The leaves of yarrow are so finely dissected that when you, when you touch them, they feel almost like a really soft brush. Queen Anne's lace leaves look like carrot tops, which totally makes sense considering that the carrots we eat are domesticated varieties of that plant, the wild carrot. Foxglove beard tongue or Penstemon digitalis is native to southeastern Iowa and scattered locations across the rest of the state, but it's been widely planted and it's really showy alongside our roadsides in June. Small worker bumblebees can crawl all the way into those flowers and then larger bumblebees kind of grab hold of them and hug the flowers with their legs while they push their heads in to reach the nectar at the base of the tube. These flowers have fertile stamens that dust the bees' backs with pollen. Then there's a hairy and sterile stamen lying on the floor of the flower that looks like a protruding tongue, and hence the name beard tongue, which doesn't sound comfortable at all. The annual daisy fleabane is a somewhat weedy native plant that comes up where there's some disturbance. I find it in my garden, and I usually let a few plants flower since it's pretty, and it attracts beneficial insects like hoverflies. By the way, the larvae of hoverflies uh, eat aphids, so I really appreciate them. In remnant prairies, you're more likely to encounter a different species of fleabane called Erigeron strigosus, though it's not very common in any of the prairies that I visit. White wild indigo is slow growing, but very long lived, and it makes an impressive specimen plant in a garden. It's one of two species of Baptisia that you can find in remnant prairies in northern Iowa. It's also planted in some reconstructions, although it takes years for it to grow big enough to be visible. Bumblebees and leafcutter bees love to visit its flowers. There are some related species of blue and yellow flowers that are rarely found growing wild in Iowa, but are often planted in gardens. Um, I have several of these plants in my own backyard prairie, and there's actually one that's growing right at the edge of a patio that we constructed about 10 years ago. We tried to dig the thing out. I tried to uh, transplant part of the root uh, and was successful in one case, but the rest of the root, which was as, at least as big around as my arm, stayed in place. And now right beside our patio where there's supposed to be a path that people can walk through is a huge Baptisia plant. And it's so beautiful. Um, I'll never try to dig it out again. We'll just let it have the path. You may see patches of wild roses on roadsides flowering in June. These are likely relic populations. The wild rose has, has deep roots and it's, it spreads by rhizomes to form these patches and will even, it'll hold on even in places that are dominated by introduced pasture grasses. The seed is somewhat difficult to produce and therefore expensive though, so you won't find these very often in, in seed mixes. Oh, and this is Iowa State flower. Canada anemone is another prairie species that has persisted in roadsides. Once established in a spot, it spreads by underground rhizomes to form dense patches. And 
this one, you can also recognize the leaves because they are um, deeply palmately lobed, so the, the lobes are arranged like the fingers in the palm of a hand. We shouldn't forget that the grasses and sedges have flowers too, even if they're not as showy. The picture at the left shows flowering June grass in a remnant prairie, and to the right is copper-shouldered oval sedge. The grasses that flower in the early summer are cool season grasses. Most of the ones you see in flower now along roadsides and in pastures are non-native species like smooth brome and reed canary grass. Unfortunately, those species are very invasive and destructive to prairie diversity. There aren't many plants that I actually hate, but reed canary grass is one of them. No, oh, so I'm going from a, a plant that I, <laughs> I profess to hate to one that I really, really love. Um, Harry Pacoon grows in remnant sand prairies. Its name, meaning dye plant, comes from an Algonquin language. The roots can be used to produce a red dye. I've looked at the roots of seedlings that I've grown and they are strikingly pink, even at an early stage. The species in this genus are notoriously hard to grow from seed. Uh, one of the techniques that I found that can help is to actually pour boiling or near boiling water onto the seeds before subjecting them to winter like temperatures. Uh, but even that, it seems to work sometimes and not others. We would love to crack their code and get them into more planting since they are important for spring pollinators and just so showy and beautiful. Now, if you're seeing a lot of pretty orange yellow flowers along roadsides, unfortunately, they are almost certainly not um, pecoon, but could very well be the invasive legume bird's foot trefoil. It has pea-like flowers, unlike the five-lobed flowers of pecoons. So you kind of have to look closely to tell the difference, but the habitat gives you a good clue. Prairie flocks is another one of my favorites. It exhibits a wide range of flower colors and patterns. So both these pictures show prairie flocks from the same prairie and there's just so much variation. It would be lovely to include this species in more, um, in more plantings, but it's difficult to grow and harvest due to the fact that its seed capsules eject the seed when ripe. Now I clicked the screen a little bit too soon because I wanted to show you um, the dame's rocket after we'd had a chance to look really nicely at the flocks, but here we go anyway. Dame's Rocket, the one that's in the the uh, please don't um, circle, um, has similar flower colors to the flocks and even a similar range of variation, but it has four petals per flower instead of five. It's also usually a larger plant and it forms dense patches that crowd out other species. So be on the lookout for Dame's Rocket um, and uh, appreciate the prairie flocks. Uh, speaking of appreciation, I'm really beginning to appreciate northern bedstraw. Every time I see it in bloom in remnant prairies, I, I notice it more that it, hap it kind of forms part of that understory or the matrix of a lot of our little remnants up here. And it's fragrant. So this time of year, it just smells so good to be um, out in the prairie. Uh, with the northern bed straw. Its foliage is also um, food for uh, some interesting species of moth caterpillars, so I, I'd like to see more of this in plantings. Here's a, a flower that you're very unlikely to see in, um, in a planted prairie. It's uh, bastard toad flax or Camandra umbellata. It's a very small plant but it's visible when flowering just by virtue of its uh, um, great abundance and density in some patches of remnant prairie. It's one of those understory plants, so you kind of have to get down low to see it. This species has green foliage, and so it's capable of doing photosynthesis and uh, generating its own energy from sunlight, but it also has this interesting strategy of tapping into the root systems of other plants, taking some of its, of its nourishment from them. And uh, this lifestyle is called hemiparasitism. And hemiparasites like this may help to maintain the species diversity of remnant prairies by reducing the competitiveness of their hosts. So this could help explain why one of the things we, we notice about remnant prairies is their sheer um, diversity of plant species. And another one that you're not likely to see 
in uh, restoration, but that are very common in remnant prairies are the rosette grasses. There are several species of these. They're in the genus Dicanthelium. Um, and the, the dicanthelium name refers to, the dye refers to two, and anthelium refers to flowering. So these are things that flower twice in the year. Uh, they flower this time, they're a cool season grass and they flower in June. And then later in the season, they'll produce um, flowers that stay closed and never get pollinated, but kind of self fertilize. Um, these are charming little tufted grasses with delicate flower heads that to me look like um, sculptures made of wire and beads. I'd love to see more of these in plantings, but it's hard to get large quantities of seed from them. Uh, they don't produce a lot of seed overall, and uh, not all of the seed that they do produce is viable. So they're going to be tricky, um, and I love a challenge, so I'm, I'm hoping to get these uh, into production someday. Well. Uh, if you'd like to learn more about the diversity of prairie plants and, and build up your skills in, um, in identifying them so that you can go beyond the stuff that we've talked about today, uh, one somewhat structured approach to learning the basics of plant identification for our region is the TPC's free online botany education courses called Botany Beginners. Uh, our 2020 course focused on learning how just how to learn the plants using wildflowers commonly found in Iowa's lawns, roadsides, plantings, and prairies. The 2021 course, Grasses for the Masses, introduced participants to 30 or more common species of grasses, along with the basic terminology and resources for identifying grasses of fields, pastures, roadsides, and prairies. And now the 2020 course is starting soon and it will focus on identification of species that are important for management of conservation reserve plantings. So check out the TPC um, website and find the botany education um, and you will find the botany beginners courses there. You can uh, participate in the recorded uh, courses anytime um, and sign up for the live one um, if you're interested soon. You can also participate in the Facebook group for Botany Beginners to share your observations and learn together with other Botany Beginners from around the state. One of the best places to start in plant identification is to check out or purchase a field guide or preferably more than one. Um, the 2020 Botany Beginners course teaches you how to use the simplified identification key in Newcomb's guide, but other guides are organized by flowering time, by flower color, or plant family, or by the flowering time. With any field guide, it's best to start by reading the introduction. Usually there will be a section on how to use this book, which will describe the system of organization in that book and how to use it to identify a plant that you've observed. Here are some of my favorite online resources to aid in plant identification. If you have your phone handy, I encourage you to snap a photo of this slide for future reference. Um, I believe this will also be um, available, this presentation should be available later, or that Jeff could make the, this list available to you easily. Uh, each of these resources provides different tools or information that can help you to narrow down your identification um, of plants that you find. I'd also encourage you to um, participate in a community of online um, naturalists. These are, um, some of them are professionals. Uh, others are uh, amateurs or just starting out uh, noticing the things around them. You can take pictures with your phone uh, or a camera and then upload those photos to the site called iNaturalist. This app then will provide you with some identification suggestions based on the appearance of the organism in the photo and we'll compare that to others in their database and with observations that were found nearby. You'll probably still have to evaluate the list of uh, suggestions that are given and you can use the resources that I provided above to help you narrow things down and decide which of those um, suggestions is the most reasonable one. When you post those observations on sites like iNaturalist, um, it's, you know, it's fun for you personally to kind of keep a record of your observations and to get identifications of the things that you've observed. But you can also be contributing to um, the pool of knowledge as a community scientist. 
So the kinds of information that these um, sites collect includes things like um, the locations of the plant populations or, you know, the locations of sightings of um, animals like insects and birds that you see. Uh, it can give us information on the timing of growth and reproduction um, of those, uh, those plants and other organisms, and also keep a record of visible variations in the, the species. If your observation happens to be useful for a specific project, you may actually be contacted by um, researchers involved in those projects. I personally contribute some of my observations to iNaturalist partly as, as kind of a record of my own explorations. And then I also explore the site to find other sightings of species that I'm interested in. Like last year, I found two populations of one of my target species for, for seed collection by using iNaturalist. One of these populations was um, off in Clay County, which is quite a ways from um, Cedar Falls. It was, it was pretty amazing to, you know, just hop in the car, drive all that way, park the car, and use the coordinates from iNaturalist to walk straight to the patch of flat-topped aster that I was looking for. So this is uh, potentially, you know, really um, useful. There are other um, uh, web or websites or apps that do this, uh, such as the Journey North that tracks um, the migrations of, of animals like the monarch butterfly uh, and uh, bumblebee watch. Uh, I personally love to, um, to observe the bumblebees that visit my yard and the production plots um, at the Tallgrass Prairie Center and also the remnant prairies that I visit. And um, I often post those observations of bumblebees on the bumblebeewatch.org site um, and then get expert identifications uh, of those, um, those bees that I have found. So it's uh, wonderful to participate in these projects and um, you get a lot out of it too. Another thing that you can do is to plant prairie plants. Uh, your yard can be a showcase of uh, Iowa's native plants. It can help educate your neighborhood on the, the value of uh, these prairie species and their beauty. Uh, we started adding native plants to our yard in, back in 1998. And we're still doing more. I've got a, an area of our backyard that is slated for destruction of grass um, this, this summer, and I'll be adding uh, transplants to that area this fall. Um, and every year we see new, um, new creatures using uh, our, the, the plantings in our backyard. So over on the left, you can see that that's a, um, Lobelia syphilitica, or great blue lobelia plant. This now just kind of comes up wild in my yard. I, I planted it years ago, and now it just finds those those little patches where that it likes and, and pops up in different places. And I had a beautiful patch of it last year, right on the edge of the vegetable garden. And lo and behold, for the first time ever last fall, I found a rusty patched bumblebee. This is the, the federally endangered species feeding on the, the great blue lobelia at the edge of our vegetable garden. So convert part of your yard to native plants and see what happens. Um, it really can be valuable habitat to some of the smallest of our wildlife. And another thing you can do is to um, find other people who are interested in prairies and join them and get involved. This can be a great way to find other opportunities to help. So I highly recommend joining groups like the Iowa Prairie Network and the Iowa Native Plant Society uh, who host meetings and these wonderful field trips where you get to explore native prairies with knowledgeable guides. Also, um, I'd encourage you to support conservation organizations like Trees Forever that's sponsoring this uh, talk today. And uh, show up and volunteer if you're able for organizations that manage remnant prairies like the Iowa Natural Heritage Foundation and your local land trusts. I'd also suggest building relationships with your county conservation board staff to learn more about your local remnant prairies and how they're being managed and um, uh, as well as their, their history and the um, amazing things that you can find there. And finally, I'd say advocate for your county uh, to join the Iowa Roadside Management Program, if they have not already, to manage their roadsides more ecologically and uh, with more native plants. I'd like to acknowledge uh, that the TPC Plant Materials Program receives funding from Iowa's Living Roadway Trust Fund at the Iowa Department of Transportation and from the University of Northern Iowa.
We're also grateful for many collaborators around the state and region and, <laughs> and beyond, including the Iowa DNR Prairie Resource Center, the USDA Plant Introduction Station in Ames, the Xerces Society for Invertebrate Conservation, Pheasants Forever, and the Natural Resources Conservation Service. I'm probably forgetting someone, and I don't want to forget to mention, of course, Trees Forever. Um, and happy trails to you. Uh, I will be present, I hope, at the meeting to answer your questions live. And I want to thank you for your attention and for your interest and effort to value uh, and protect our state's prairies. Thanks. Good night.